Alex Gibney in the snowy Park Avenue. In the house. Yeah. So, so you brought Magic Trip up here. How many times have you been to Sundance now? I mean, Enron and... I was here with the Blues, too. Right. Gonzo, Casino Jack. Um, so it's a yeah, regular magic uh, trip. trip. Yeah, it's a so trip. And actually, uh, Magic Trip had its origins here because Allison Elwood and I, my co-director on Magic Trip, were flying out here for Enron. 2005, and in the New Yorker, we read this piece by Robert Stone, the novelist, who had briefly been on the famous bus. There's a shot of him there. Yeah, he's in the movie, and um, and his voice is well repeatedly in the film. But uh, but um, he wrote a piece about Ken Kesey and the pranksters. A really good piece, I thought, and just happened to note that there were you know there was like 40 hours of 16 millimeter film. I thought, wow, wouldn't that be interesting? to find. And it took a long time to get the rights and then to restore it because it had been badly damaged. And it um, wasn't even in sync, right? Well, that's a, you know, here's the story. Ken Kesey decides that after writing two very successful novels, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest and Sometimes a Great Notion, he decides this literary world, you know, it's too stuffy. So he wanted to get out with the cameras and record real life the way people really talk. And I think he had seen Breathless by Godard and also Leacock and all these guys. So he buys the best cameras, really good cameras, portable, lightweight cameras, and the best sound equipment. Only one thing he forgot, a cameraman. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and a sound man. We have, we have a photograph of the sound man, Sandy Lehmanhout. Um, you know, his mouth stuffed with wires, you know, which is not exactly what they recommend, you know, as he's trying to, you know, figure out the sound and the mic and the fact is that you know in the old days you needed to, to do a clapper to put the double system in sync that's how the editor knows well we Allison scanned all 40 hours not once no sorry once they, <laughs> they did a clapper so you have hours and hours and hours of sound and absolutely no idea so we hired lip readers um, no yes we did we hired lip readers so that, so that we would know what they were saying so then we could listen for those sounds. Then we listened for certain kinds of atmosphere. We listened for certain characters once we'd identified them. And we <coughs> had buckets. And, and Allison and, and uh, Lindy Yankura, who uh, uh, also you know, was an editor on this film, finally found a way to put some of the film in sync. Which is why a lot of it is silent. Yeah, or because there isn't that much actually. I was noticing. Well, you hear that. a good bit of sound, but it's kind of low in the background, and there's a lot of music, and and there's a lot of voiceover in the film. No on-camera interviews. That was the other funny thing about this movie. I I, I call it archival cinema verite. That's a good uh, description. Because we, you know, I started out doing the same old, same old, which is interviewing the participants and. Oh, I remember when, and blah, 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 blah. Well, you needed to find some kind of narrative. Well, I did. But, but that way, I felt it was all wrong. It just felt too distant. It felt like Ameri you know, it, it felt like the same old, same old, like, I remember when. And it felt very distant. Um, well, and it's so, more than, what, 35 yeah, years ago. Yeah, exactly. But what I wanted was a feeling like you're on the bus, mm. a more of an immersion experience. So we found these audio tapes of them way back in the day, commenting about the trip and use those um, audio tapes to put in sync, I mean, not to use as commentary for the picture. And then, um, uh, you know, uh, so that it had this kind of freshness. It felt like you were being immersed in the time. So rather than, you know, a bunch of old people looking back yeah, no, on the definitely, good old days. Definitely. So how would you, what would your... Um, Oh, I want to step back for a second. The, the characters are, there are many characters running through this, and you're obviously following some of the romantic entanglements, which are enjoyable. And Kesey himself, who is sort of the master of ceremonies, manipulating the whole thing, and he's delightful. He's yeah. lovely. I fell in, if I wasn't in love with him already from his writing, I fell in love with him in this movie. He is a magical character. He, well, and he is a guy who loved magic and everything that magic represented, which was kind of this mysterious force, you know. Um, but no, Ken Kesey, as, as one woman says in the film, he had charisma coming out of his ears. He's so charming, such a great storyteller, so 
compassionate, so congenial, so much fun. Mm -hmm. You know, he's great. He's the star of the film, and really, it's about him. Um, and it, you know, it's the magic with a, trip with the second, the second character, of course, being Cassidy. Right. Well, Cassidy is the driver. You know, in both <laughs> you, narratively you read and the electric Kool Aid acid test, right, or on the road, and you knew about this speedy, you know, guy, but to actually see him and is hear so him. and here and he's he's gorgeous. He's gorgeous. Rock is jaw. He gay? Is he really gay? Is that the deal? He's both. He's oh. polymorphous, perverse. Mm. Anything that was sexual, Cassidy was into. Mm. So men, women, mm. you know, because he was lovers with Allen Ginsberg, uh, but also, you know, he had many. He's hired, you know, children. He. He had many female lovers. And he's just doing speed the whole time. Yeah. And, you can, and he's just blah, 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 <laughs> blah. And, and as most people said about him, it's like he's a radio. And he was just talking nonstop. And, and it's so funny because he's the driver on the way to New York. They were going to New York, the New York World's Fair. And then he's not the driver on the way back. He gets off the bus and the bus has a completely different vibe. Instead of this kind of antic, manic vibe, there are all so these mellow, couples. You right, know, these that, couples. I love that shot, the thing where you go, the, the, they wake up one morning and everybody's fucking. Right. <laughs> everybody was the fucking. The bus is rocking. Right. The bus is rocking. And everybody, you know, in, in probably in tandem, they probably got the rhythm and the whole bus. So, yeah, it was, a, it was wild. And, and in a way, this is like the great origin story of the 60s. Because yeah. this is not Because it was ahead of it. This, it. Yeah, this is not the Hate asbury 60s. They were making it up as they went along. The whole sense of that became the environmental movement, the sexual revolution, um, drugs, acid, acid, um, and then you get that they get to uh, Timothy Leary. He doesn't even want to see them. No, he, and they he, have to hang out with Bob Arantas. Well, he is Mr. Uptight. <laughs> Timothy Leary is Mr. Uptight, and he's coming down from a trip. But Timothy Leary was all about sort of the science and the the poetry, and these guys wanted to have fun. I mean, and part of what they were doing was saying, you know. We're a country that's been living in fear, right? So come out of your bomb shelters and let's have some fun. It was uh, anarchistic. Yeah, very anarchistic. And, and a sense of challenging that fear that had gripped the country for so long. Um, so, yeah.